Okay, we'll get started. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm Elliot Abrams. Uh, I chair the board of uh, Vandenberg, and we're delighted to host this event, which is actually the first of a number we'll be doing with elected officials discussing foreign policy. Um, the timing is partly that, the beginning of um, the post-election session, and partly, of course, the book. Um, I've read the senator's book. Of course, I got it, and I immediately turned it over to look at the blurbs to see who blurbed it. There are no blurbs. I figured, you know, you probably asked Kissinger, and he read what you said about China, and he said no, and then you gave up. But, you know, he's not the only great foreign policy thinker. I mean, did you ask Rex Tillerson? No. <laughs> probably not. Did you ask Michael Flynn? Pro probably not. Um, the problem with having no blurbs is when people are trying to decide whether to buy the book, you know, and there are no blurbs, they have to go by the reviews. Now, we were all waiting for the New York Times review of this book, and the book is actually about American government and American foreign policy. So they might have to have two reviews, and I'm thinking, who are they going to choose? Maybe Ben Rhodes? It's likely, for, for the foreign policy part, Nicole Hannah-Jones for the American government part. I'm sure it'll be completely fair, balanced, what's the term? Fair, balanced, and unafraid um, reviews. The book, um, you remember the famous phrase by uh, Churchill upon being served a dessert he did not like. This pudding has no theme. You won't have that view reading this book, which does have a theme, um, which I would describe as looking at a century of American government and foreign policy, since basically since Woodrow Wilson, looking at what's gone right and what's wrong, and um, ending with a chapter on how to set it right. It's a very straightforward book. I, I wanted to read a sentence, two sentences actually, to give you a sense of it, and you will see from even just these sentences that this is a book that the senator wrote. A ghostwriter did not write it. He asked, quote, what are the blessings of liberty when it comes to foreign policy? The phrase may strike some as general or vague, but I think the founder's example and some common sense can work out its meaning as what most Americans rightly expect their government to provide and protect. Safety, freedom, and prosperity. Um, I, I hand you over to the executive director of the Vandenberg Coalition, Kerry Filippetti, who will interrogate the senator. So thank you very much, Elliot. Um, thank you to everyone for coming out to this event. I'm very happy to be doing in-person events uh, again. We've been doing a bunch of virtual ones. Um, and the Vandenberg Coalition is really excited to be having this conversation with you, Senator. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Vandenberg Coalition is an experts network that promotes a strong and proud foreign policy. Um, and we've been holding this series called The Future of Conservative Foreign Policy over the last year, really speaking to experts, grand strategists, and now policymakers about what their future vision of conservative foreign policy can look like, particularly in a world where conservative foreign policy seems to be divided among isolationists and internationalists, and there being very little home for people who fall somewhere in the middle of, of that spectrum. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you all know Senator Cotton, um, but he has served as a U.S. Senator from Arkansas since 2015. He currently serves on the Judiciary Committee and the Armed Services Committee. And prior to this, Senator Cotton was a member of the House of Representatives, as well as served with the Old Guard at Arlington National Cemetery, as well as in Iraq and Afghanistan as an infantry army officer. Most recently, as you all know and why we're here, Senator Cotton is the author of Only the Strong, which is his latest book exposing the dangers and consequences of a weak and ideological foreign policy, and with uh, and which three Vandenberg Advisory Board members have actually recently 
reviewed, um, including uh, John Hillen, Peter Berkowitz, and Colin Dueck. So I encourage everyone to read them. They were very positive reviews, as you can, as you can probably guess. Um, so thank you so much, Senator, for, uh, for being here. Um, I want to start, uh, obviously, by, by getting into your book, um, Only the Strong, which describes a sort of bifurcation um, among Democrats on foreign policy. So you describe those progressives who push for an internationalism that surrenders American power to multilateral institutions. And then on the other hand, you have what you call those blame America first Democrats who advocate isolationism because of what they consider to be America's net negative impact on the world. It strikes me that this new war between isolationists and hyper-interventionists is sort of playing out within the Republican Party as well. And so I wonder, how do you see the Republican foreign policy movement, and do you think we're headed for or within a, a similar bifurcation? Thanks, Carrie, and thanks, Ellen, for having me, and thanks to the Vandenberg Coalition for hosting this. Um, I'll, I'll come to the Republican part of the question momentarily, but, but just to give context, what I write about Ellen is strong, uh, really goes back to the progressive era, and Woodrow Wilson, the, maybe the first progressive, the patron saint of the modern progressive movement, who, unlike any contemporary politician, openly and explicitly repudiated uh, our founding, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and, and most fundamentally, the, the moral basis of our country, that there is a, a fixed and eternal, timeless kind of human nature, that nature is uh, equal, uh, that it's uh, gives us all certain inherent rights. Most of you probably cite the famous language from the opening paragraph or two of the Declaration, um, and replaced it with a kind of historical determinism, determinism history with a capital H, if you will, uh, that history is kind of moving in, in a single direction, and now, you know, 100, 125 years after the founding, Woodrow Wilson and the other progressives were able to see, you know, the things that the founders couldn't see, and they were reaching, uh, you know, what, uh, who they drew from, German Romanticism specifically, uh, Hegel, you're going to reach the so-called rational state. You didn't need things like checks and balances, and separation of powers, and federalism at home because if we didn't have a fixed nature, that means our nature is perfect, perfectible. Uh, but abroad, what it meant is that you didn't need to have the kind of grimy, grubby, kind of dirty uh, foreign policy based on national interests. That's going to be more policy all This again draws from experiment of romanticism most notable in um, And that's why you see in Woodrow's war message, for instance, that he declared, declared war on Germany, though you almost don't even know it's Germany, as opposed to abstractions. Um, not because they had killed over 100 Americans in Lusitania, they had interfered with their commerce, uh, with unrestricted submarine warfare, they conspired with the Mexican government to try to seize territory in the southwest now. But all these distractions. Um, now, he was still willing to go to war, as was FDR, as was Truman. Uh, but once you repudiate the moral basis of America, it's not very far from repudiating America itself. And that's what you got to in the 60s and 70s with the so called New Left, uh, who helpfully, from their point of view, would spell America with K uh, in the German fashion to remind everybody what they thought of America. And this is what Gene Kirkpatrick famously called the Black America. Democrats. Uh, so you could say that, that both the progressives and the white American first Democrats viewed America as, as flawed and, and sinful from the very beginning, whereas the progressives thought maybe they could redeem America with sins by casting off this outdated, outmoded, beautiful world and, and going, uh, uh, going, trying to redeem America by using American power. We saw this, for instance, in 1993 with Madame Famously, infamously said that she wanted to put troops in the Balkans to keep the peace that wasn't even extant at the time. Told the house that, you know, you have wives, well, why do you have a straight military if you can't use it? Uh, but you also see a kind of isolationism as well, where America is so flawed and so corrupt that we really can't do anything. Uh, this is most notably you see from someone like Bernie Sanders. I, I don't see that kind of a bifurcation in our party, uh, and, and I think as you the history and the strong you won't either um, because our, our party doesn't share that that flawed premise that in America I mean we we still believe in our founding we believe in those founding principles but there's a fixed and timeless human nature as our founders said um, it it has a certain degree of virtue that makes self-government possible 
and self-government presumes that more than any other form of government. But there's a certain degree, um, I think Madison said of depravity as well, or I think Hamilton said in Metal of Six that men are ambitious, vindictive, and rapacious. And if that is true of human nature, simply it's doubly true of human nature when it's applied to the world. So especially most Americans, and uh, I just got back to Washington, so I've been around normal Americans for the last seven weeks, <laughs> uh, not people inside the Beltway. Um, most Americans still kind of view the world the way Ronald Reagan did. And, and there's a lot of continuity between, I think, the Reagan, maybe one of the greatest statesmen of the 20th century, uh, with those presidents, Republican presidents who came up before him, Richard Nixon and Eisenhower, and those after George Bush, George W. Bush, Donald Trump. Obviously, there are some differences, certain differences of, of emphasis, but nothing like uh, the tensions in, in the Democratic Party that get it back to that fundamental, fundamental uh, premise that you know, there is no fixed human nature. Uh, it is not timeless and eternal, therefore, it can't be a guide, but we can have a, we have an opportunity to remake the world, fundamentally transform America, as Barack Obama said. Um, so, obviously, some tensions and disagreements, especially on this or that. Particular question as I write and on the strong uh, foreign policy is uh, in particular the domain of prudential reasoning uh, in a way that domestic policy isn't always um, because there's always 101 different considerations before you uh, take action in the world and you've got to reason people very carefully and there are more people uh, of goodwill um, and who are right and who share some of the same basic principles don't always come to the same conclusion about this or that specific action. Sure. And then you also spend a lot of time in your in your book sort of discussing the importance of military power as a cornerstone of American strength. Um, what are the other elements of national power that you think are important to American national security? I mean, we see China using soft power consistently um, to, to undermine the United States. And how do you think policymakers should think about combining military and non-military means of national power to achieve our goals? Well, it can't be stressed enough uh, just how fundamental the military is to our national power. I mean, Europe has a combined economy as large or maybe larger than ours, um, and they're not nearly as influential in the world. Partly that's political because of their, their continuing divisions despite the efforts by some to create a, a transnational state in Brussels, but it's fundamentally because our military has capabilities that Europe's military does not. Um, and one reason why, even as you see, for instance, at the ASEAN uh, conference uh, right now, these countries that combined have much more trade with China than we have, still looking to us half a world away, is because uh, of our military and the security guarantees we can provide around the world. So I, I can't stress enough how fundamental uh, our military strength is to national power. Um, second, it, it's often overlooked just because it kind of is and sits there and never changes. Um, but our geography, you know, it's been said, I think it was Nicholas Spikeman, a famous theorist at Yale, that uh, geography is the most fundamental fact of foreign policy because it's the most permanent fact. It just never changes. And we're very blessed that we live, you know, between these two great oceans, the two great oceans on the earth that connect us both to Europe and connect us to the Asian Pacific, um, that we only have two countries on our border, one of which is the longest demilitarized border in the world. Unfortunately, the other which is kind of a disaster, but we should do something about that. Um, that we have nothing but warm water ports, unlike a lot of nations. So it's, again, it's something that's often overlooked, but if you weren't sitting in America, um, you were sitting at a geographically disadvantaged country, you'd look at us and think that's a very big advantage they have. Um, third, our economic might, obviously, because you know ultimately one's economy uh, fuels one's military. Even more specifically in our economic mind, I would say dollar dominance and the fact that the dollar is the reserve currency. It allows us to take actions, especially ac actions uh, against targeted individuals or organizations, whether it's, say, the Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iran or terrorists uh, in the Middle East or drug cartels in Mexico. Um, so it's something that we should always be very careful and that we should husband uh, very mindfully. So those are just a few of the advantages we have. Not all of them, obviously, but those are a few. I think credibility is in some ways another important component of, of American power and, and, and developing our alliances. You were, of course, a strong and vocal critic of our abandonment of Afghanistan, having served in Afghanistan. 
Um, we've seen some sort of isolationist sentiment, let's call it, during this campaign cycle. Um, as many of us in this room know, um, it, uh, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy advocated for Ukrainian aid during the passing of the first Ukraine supplemental, and then a few weeks ago questioned whether a Republican-led Congress would continue writing what he referred to as a blank check um, to Ukraine. So I'm curious, you know, how do you interpret these, these comments, and are you concerned about an isolationist sentiment when it comes to Ukraine specifically um, in, in this upcoming Congress? No, not, not really. Again, after having been on the trail for the last six or seven weeks, um, it, it's just not an issue that really motivated many voters I heard, and I heard from many more voters who were worried about what we were going to keep doing to support Ukraine or who were interested to hear more about the details of Ukraine's advances on the battlefield over the last two months or so. Um, and, and I'm glad that the speaker-to-be, McCarthy, uh, clarified the comments. Um, I will say this, and I think this may have been what he, one thing he was getting at, is uh, the Biden administration needs to do a much better job of getting more financial support from Europe. Um, when it comes to military support, uh, I mean, Europe has some, some strong and powerful uh, defense firms that can support what Ukraine is doing on the battlefield, but we shouldn't kid ourselves. Um, America's defense industry is uh, unparalleled in the world and most of the critical weapon systems uh, that have been key difference makers on the battlefield, especially in these last two months, are American uh, systems. You know, a lot of what you read about in the newspaper, like this $100 million, that billion dollar, they're not like just blank checks we're sending to the Ukrainian government. They are the in-kind uh, dollar value of the rounds and their artillery systems and the rocket systems that we're sending them. Uh, and, and we're one of the only nations that are capable of doing that. Again, other nations have good defense industries um, like Sweden or Czechia or uh, Italy, what have you, um, but only the United States can provide some of that military support. Europe can provide financial support, though. They can send the simple checks to Ukraine to help keep the lights on or maintain uh, uh, you know, basic infrastructure. And it's still just the case that we we sent more than all of Europe combined, even though, again, they're in aggregate wealthier than we are. So I think the Biden administration, in particular, if they want to maintain what, what I think is fairly healthy political support among the American people for our, our military aid to Ukraine, needs to press um, Europe, specifically Paris and Berlin and Brussels, more aggressively to provide the kind of economic and financial aid that Ukraine needs. There needs to be more balance uh, in what we're providing and what Europe's providing. Speaking of Europe, so um, one of our number one security threats obviously is, is China. Um, Europe can provide more in, in the way of budgetary support to Ukraine right now. What do you think the European reaction would be? How much support do you think they would provide to the United States if there were to be some sort of altercation um, between Taiwan and China? Do you think our European allies would be there for us? Probably not militarily. So the other side of the world, few of them have the ability to project much power to the other side of the world. Um, what we would need from them is the same kind of economic and financial um, support that they've provided to Ukraine since Russia invaded. I wish they'd been providing before Russia had invaded. Um, I, uh, I think this, the, the odds that they would provide that kind of support and target China if China did invade Taiwan it have improved in recent years. It's still not great. Uh, I mean, you saw Olaf Scholz go to China a couple weeks ago uh, with essentially the German Chamber of Commerce and repeat some of the same mistakes when it comes to German manufacturing uh, and access to the Chinese market that Angela Merkel uh, committed when it came to Russian gas in the 2000s. So it, I'm not sure they've yet learned all the lessons they should in Europe. I, I think it's improved in recent years, um, but uh, I think it would take uh, forceful American leadership and very, very competent resolve that we would come to Taiwan's aid and it would be, if anything, a protracted conflict uh, for Europe to engage in the same kind of economic sanctions against China that they did in Russia. Because I, I would remind everyone, for the first four or five days of this war in February, um, most European nations were bickering over who were going to get carve-outs for the sanctions. I think because they all thought it would be over within three or four days and they didn't want to cut off their nose to spot their face. It was only when 
um, the Ukrainian army and, and to some considerable extent Ukrainian people stood up and successfully fought back in those first four or five days that it really shamed a lot of Western capitals to get serious about European sanctions. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to see the same kind of military success uh, in a conflict over Taiwan for some European nations to be serious uh, about targeting China economically. And do you consider, I mean, you've been obviously a leading voice on, on the Hill raising the need to crack down on, on China's um, malign economic and trade practices. What do you consider, what do you think will be the outlook for, for this new Congress on, on the China economic question? Uh, I, I think good. I, I think House Republicans will be more serious about it than were House Democrats. Uh, I think they spoke a good game. Uh, I think they didn't act much. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not in the House anymore, so I don't follow the ins and outs of their internal deliberations um, as much as I, I once did when I was there. But I think the House Republicans are even considering having a, a kind of select committee on China itself, and, and that might be a healthy development. Um, unfortunately, I mean, uh, the Biden administration has been kind of restraining uh, action uh, on this question for some time now. Uh, you know, it's not a very well-kept secret that there's something known as the Bipartisan Taiwan Policy Act in, in Congress, and the Biden administration worked overtime to try to kill it in committee and then keep it off of the defense authorization bill. Uh, much like Barack Obama in 2009, 2010, went to great lengths behind the scenes to try to kill Iran sanctions bills, and then only finally jumped in front of the parade when it was clear they were going to pass with 99 votes. Um, so I, I think the open question is, uh, does the administration, working with congressional Democrats, try to block legislative action that could help prepare our nation for potential conflict with China and therefore deter that conflict, or do they work behind the scenes to try to water it down or... Um, you spoke a bit about how you've been outside of D.C. Um, for the last uh, couple of weeks. And so what are, what's one thing that you sort of bring back from your travels throughout the United States talking to real Americans, not D.C. Americans, um, and what they think about in the foreign policy space, right? Because there's often the sense that Americans aren't tracking foreign policy, don't care about foreign policy. What was your read of what Americans are concerned about right now? Well, foreign, foreign policy is fundamentally different from domestic policy uh, when it comes to politics. Most people live there, live domestic policy every day. So, I mean, if people are struggling to make ends meet, you're not, you can't tell them, you can't reason them into the fact like, oh, we're having a recovery because this obscure statistic from the Bureau of Labor Statistics says so. Um, it just doesn't work that way. Um, or, you know, if they care passionately about something like gun owners' rights, uh, again, you're usually not going to, you know, lobby them to change their mind uh, on much of anything related to that issue. It's not the case with foreign policy because very few people live foreign policy. Um, even some of the people in this room who probably do live foreign policy I mean, as it relates to China, uh, you probably don't know that much about Brazil or maybe Latin America entirely. So um, it, it's just fundamentally different and always has struck me that way going back to my first campaign. You'd get asked kind of closed-ended cross-examination questions about domestic policy. You're not gonna raise taxes, are you? You know, you're not going to vote to take away guns, are you? Whereas on the campaign trail, uh, in my first campaign about foreign policy, it would be more kind of open-ended um, uh, questions like, what should we do about Libya? Like, what's happening in Syria? So pe people, because they don't live it every single day, um, they have, they're, they're more open to kind of being informed, educated, persuaded on a lot of these issues. Uh, what underlies their, their views usually in, in, in my experiences is just a deep and abiding faith uh, in American strength and confidence about uh, America's um, cause and, and our leading role in the world. Again, that doesn't mean that they want to commit our troops everywhere in the world. That doesn't mean that they want to prop up with economic aid, you know, every government in the world, but they believe in America. They believe that America is a good nation, that we always have been, um, and that we've done more for the cause of human freedom, and that we've uh, been able to defend ourselves and make ourselves, grow ourselves into the greatest nation that mankind has ever known because we were strong and confident and proud. Um, 
at least that's you know what I hear from Republican voters, and I think a lot of swing voters. Well, even some kind of more traditional Democrats, the way we still have some in Arkansas. Uh, that's not what you hear much from the left, you know, as I write about, and only the strong. Like, when was the last time you heard, you know, a, a Democratic politician speak unabashedly, unashamedly, and simply proud of America and, and proud of what we've done in the world? Um, that that kind of deep and abiding sense of, of patriotism uh, and the justice of our cause doesn't, again, doesn't necessarily translate into this or that kind of foreign policy decision, because again, foreign policy is not really the domain um, of you know abstract ideologies and and doctrinaire approaches. Um, it's the domain of prudential or practical reasoning, um, but it still kind of informs what they think of the world. Do you think there is an opportunity to bring back um, the idea of American exceptionalism to the Democratic Party, for example, or or to introduce it to the Democratic Party, or do you think that that is sort of too foregone at this point? Well, the man who remains the most powerful and influential Democrat in America, Barack Obama, uh, said that he only believed in it in the way that Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism and Brits probably believe in British exceptionalism, which is really a way of saying that the idea of American exceptionalism is a kind of obsolete, outmoded, almost childish chauvinism for one's own. Um, and... Uh, and that way of thinking is pretty dominant on the progressive left today, uh, pretty dominant among Democratic um, leaders. Not, not Democrats across America. Again, we still have lots of Democrats in Arkansas, lots of sheriffs and other county judges are Democrats, or they're increasingly less so. Um, in many cases, not losing their campaigns, just recognizing the Democratic Party left them a long time ago, the way Ronald Reagan said, and joining our ranks. Um, but... Uh, um, I'm, uh, I'm doubt I have my doubts about Democratic leaders. And again, you don't hear that kind of talk in Congress either. I mean, it's almost always the, the kind of progressive abstractions that Woodrow Wilson talked about. We're going to, you know, we're fighting you know, a war of democracy against authoritarianism. Well, the, it really begs the question of, like, which democracy and which authoritarianism, or more likely, which authoritarianism versus which authoritarianism. And as I write in Only the Strong, I mean, you know, it'd be great if every country in the world was, you know, like Great Britain or... Israel, and they shared our political system and our cultural and, se and social sensibilities, and they had a shared historic and linguistic and historic uh, or a religious background, but it's just not the way the world works. It's not the way it ever has. It may not be the way it ever works, so we've got to take our friends where we can find them. Um, again, that's not the way the American people think about these things. They think about them very concretely, like who are our friends, who are our foes, what's going to advance our interests, as Elliot read in his introduction, what's going to contribute most to our safety, our freedom, and our prosperity. You just don't hear Democrats talk about things concretely like that. It's, you know, democracy and authoritarianism and the rules-based international order, which no one ever picked up a rifle to defend. Sure. Well, I think it's time for us to turn to some Q&A from the audience. Um, so if you're interested in asking a question, please raise your hand, and my colleague Sam Byers will, will walk around um, with, with a microphone. Um, it looks like we have one right over here. And please just say your name and affiliation if, if you're comfortable. Uh, hi, I'm Wes Culp. I work at AEI. Um, Mike, so to kind of go to your point about, you know, the people, you know, on domestic issues might ask a kind of close-ended cross-examining question with kind of a, they have the answer in mind, and with foreign policy, they might not have one in mind. Um, do you have any thoughts on kind of how a, you know, people in Congress who are maybe, who believe in American exceptionalism and kind of believe in a strong America in the world can help kind of beat those in America to the question who might try and fill their mind with, say, oh, you know, America is this great evil or we're more bad than we are good. How do we, uh, I guess, win that messaging? Attend more Vandenberg events, have more Vandenberg events. I'll take it. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, organizations like AEI, you know, Hudson and, and Hoover and others, uh, they all do great work there. Um, I, again, um, especially in the House, because there's so many, so many more members of the House, and the House tends to be as it was for me, so where sometimes people start, or especially in, in Washington where they start. Um, a lot of times you, you have new members of the House of Representatives who haven't thought through a lot of these things, they've not traveled widely, they've not read a lot of history, 
Um, so in the same way that I, I said normal Americans who are busy with their lives and developing strong opinions about domestic policy don't always have the same strong opinions about foreign policy, the same thing is true uh, with a lot of new members of Congress as well. Um, and, and that just requires you know, shoe leather and um, a lot of patient effort. I mean, the best model for this I can think of is, is APAC. You know, APAC has been doing this for decades, specifically as it relates to the U.S.-Israel alliance. Most people, once they've gotten to the point of running for the House of Representatives, probably have some kind of vague general sense of what that alliance is about. Um, but the kind of detailed, thorough knowledge that APAC representatives bring, you know, when they fly in from Arkansas to meet with us, and especially when they fly in from Arkansas to meet with new members. We haven't had one, a new member in Arkansas for a while, but when they fly in to meet with new members of Congress, it really is very helpful. Um, and, and especially hearing it from their people back home, not just from, I mean, not to say all of you, but folks who work in Washington, uh, it, it does make a, a, a real difference. Um, so again, it, it's something that it takes a little bit of effort. It takes some time uh, and patience, um, but it really is important to help those new members of Congress in particular um, learn about issues that they really had no reason to learn about. If they were just in business or they were in the state legislature or their county officers, they were worried about a different set of issues. Um, and, and now that they're in the Congress, they have to get up to speed on, on new issues. Other questions? Uh, yes. Senator, thank you. My name is Jeremy Furchgott from Barron. I have a question about will to fight. You mentioned Ukraine and the tremendous will to fight that the whole world saw. What do you think the American people's will to fight would be if there were to be a confrontation with China? Um, and relatedly, uh, do you have any thoughts on Taiwan's will to fight in, in a similar confrontation? Um, many, many uh, dead tyrants uh, got that way because they underestimated America's will to fight. Uh, so I, I don't think anyone should ever underestimate our people's will to fight, especially uh, once we are provoked. It, it is true that democratic peoples, and maybe the American people more than any, uh, tend to be slow to anger, uh, but once our anger uh, has risen, um, woe to the person that inflicted the wound. Um, you know, as the Japanese learned in World War II, or Osama bin Laden learned, um, you know, 10 years after 9-11, um, and our memory is very long as well. So. I, I would caution any of our adversaries uh, against misperceiving uh, America's will to fight and our, uh, the pride we have in our country um, based on what they might hear from some of our elected leaders. Um, in, in Ukraine, you know, I, I never doubted it that much. I mean, there's a few things that make people more willing to fight than invasion of one's homeland and the death and destruction of one's soil and family and kin. Um, you know, Churchill wrote about this in, in the history of the English-speaking peoples uh, going back you know, to the Roman period um, uh, about just how vicious the battles were there, but how it's a primordial right uh, of every man to fight and to kill and to die for his own land. Um, we shouldn't be surprised, I don't think, that miserable Russian conscripts uh, are not very excited about fighting in Vladimir Putin's war of aggression against Ukraine. Um, I, I tend to think you'd see something similar in Taiwan. Uh, of course, the willingness to fight and the ability to fight are not divorced from each other. The, the more you are trained and the more you are armed to the teeth, the more likely you are to be willing to fight. If, if Ukraine was fighting with the blankets and ponchos and meals ready to eat that Barack Obama gave them in 2014 and 15, they might not be quite as willing to fight against Russian uh, heavy artillery and uh, tanks and so forth. Uh, that's why it's so important that right now we do everything we can to bolster the Taiwanese will to fight if it come to that uh, by providing them all the weapons they would need to slow down and, and hopefully defeat an invasion uh, from the mainland with American assistance. Nice. Senator, my name is Max Castro Paredes. I work at Harvard's Belfer Center. Um, I remember at my time at DHS, you were, you were leading on one of the biggest crackdowns on Chinese influence with Confucius Institutes on our college campuses. Uh, I know this is a subject that Carrie knows very well as 
too, uh, given the uh, recent stuff going on at UVA, but also Georgetown on uh, crackdowns on, the, on those campuses on Chinese influence. Is there any appetite uh, to do more on that in the next Congress and uh, with your colleagues, uh, but also both Republicans and Democrats? Thank you. I think there will be, and I hope we do. I write about this at some length in only the strong. Uh, what I call the China lobby is pervasive in America, pervasive. It's not just a, a few you know, think tanks that get funded with Chinese money in Washington, though of course there is that. Um, it's everywhere. This college campus is a good example. Not just Confucius Institute, you know, professors who are on the take from Chinese communists. It's from everywhere, from University of Arkansas to, to Harvard University. Um, you look at uh, a lot of local and state politicians, unfortunately. They may not be consciously doing it, but when China is dangling billions of dollars of foreign direct investment into their state that promises thousands of jobs, well, you know, it's not uncommon for them to come to Washington and talk to their senators and congressmen, um, asking them to tone it down. Um, you know, if you keep on going on about the Uyghurs and you know, the genocide against them, then we're not gonna get this new factory with Chinese money. Um, Look at Hollywood. There's a reason why there hasn't been a Chinese villain in an American movie in more than a decade. It's because all of Hollywood wants access to Chinese movie theaters. Um, did you know that every major news network in America except for Fox is owned by or affiliated with a Hollywood movie studio? Think about it. ABC and Disney, CBS and Paramount, NBC and Universal, CNN, Time Warner. Fox was until they split a few years back. Do you really count on all those networks uh, to call it straight on China when the suits higher up are worried about access to the Chinese market? Look at the NBA. Look what happened to the Houston Rockets GM when he merely retweeted. He didn't even write it. He just hit the retweet button um, in defense of democracy protesters in Hong Kong. The league came down on him like a ton of bricks. LeBron James, who doesn't just want the NBA to have access but wants his own movies to have access uh, to the Chinese market came down on like a ton of bricks. So it, it's pervasive and you see it everywhere. And one of the reasons I write about it and only the strong and I talk about it in forums like this is I want the American people to be aware of it, to be aware of just how pervasive Chinese influence is in our country so we can try to counteract it. Uh, there are a few things that I think could gain traction. It wouldn't solve all these problems, but could address some of them. You know, I've got legislation, for instance, to ban the sale of American farmland uh, to the Chinese Going back to what we talked about earlier about military power, our geography, our economic might, dollar dominance, um, it's a simple fact that one of the most important one of, one of the most important attributes of any nation state is the ability to feed itself. And America doesn't just feed itself; it feeds the entire world. China can't feed itself. Why would we sell them our farmland so they can help solve that problem, um, as opposed to use use our surplus to help our friends and our partners around the world who are in the same bind? Um, I think we need to ban TikTok. I look around the room, I don't see anyone young enough to be making TikTok videos. I hope I'm right about that. <laughs> Maybe Elliot Abrams is out there making them. <clears throat> but, I mean, it's not just, not just bad, bad for kids in America, which is why in China, you know, they only get to use, do like 40 minutes of TikTok a night, and it's all wholesome and educational. It's not what's done here. But it also is uh, um, very, very dangerous from the standpoint of, your personal privacy, privacy and, and data security. Um, I hope President Biden this morning told uh, Xi Jinping that the uh, rule that was announced a month ago on semiconductors was only the first step in trying to decouple our economies in critical strategic sectors. I mean, we'll see as we learn more about that meeting and we see what they're willing to do to work with us uh, in the next Congress. Um, so I think there's some incremental steps we can take, um, but uh, it probably won't be enough over the next two years. I think it'll take a new administration with a new and urgent focus on it. I mean, the Trump administration did a lot of, took a lot of positive steps in this direction, especially in the last year, year and a half. Um, but uh, I, I wish they would have started from the very first day in 2017. Other questions? Yeah, Shay. <clears throat> Sorry to make you move around so much, Sam. Uh, uh, hi, my name is Shay Kitiri, and I don't have an affiliation. By the way, you should follow Elliot on TikTok, actually. It's at regime change. <laughs> Uh, I spent, as the exciting young life that I have, I spent two weeks ago Saturday, Saturday night reading uh, the recently released BMDR, and it was quite striking to me, and it's been striking to me, that there has been no talk about uh, something like the Strategic Defense Initiative that, the, that President Reagan had 
especially having had all the threats by Putin and his nuclear weapons. And we had the HGV uh, test last year by the Chinese. And I was wondering, one, why haven't we had a, and a, a prominent discussion about having a defensive uh, missile defense uh, program? And two, uh, is there any political will on that front to spend that money and invest in it, which I think is a very important uh, part of the American security? I think part of that goes back to the mistaken belief among uh, Democrats, but a lot of Republicans as well in the 1990s um, after the Cold War ended or at least you know, took a pause uh, with Russia that, that that was obsolete. We didn't need to worry about it anymore. We were all going to be happy, friendly, you know, uh, end of history, liberal democracies. Um, it's also an ideological almost theological commitment of Democrats, like Joe Biden in the 1980s when he was a senator, that missile defense is inherently destabilizing, um, which I, I think is foolish, obviously. I mean, in, in its very name, it is defensive, it's not offensive. Um, this goes hand in hand with the terrible budget cuts you had in the Clinton years and the Obama years, as I outlined, and only the strong. And when the defense budget is being squeezed, it's hard to even engage in the basic research and development to have an effective ballistic missile defense um, much less to field it. Um, and finally, I, I would say, you know, this, there's a specific problem here as well, the North Korea problem. It's, uh, it's very regrettable that our leaders for, for decades now have uh, neglected the North Korea problem, because it's very different from the, the Russia and the, and the China problem. Um, those are vast continental nations with nuclear triads, and their ballistic missiles are deep inside their own territory. Um, what we think of as ballistic missile defense is... Um, is really the only thing we can use against them. North Korea is not. North Korea is a small country on a peninsula, and we're allied uh, and have troops present on that peninsula, and we have ships in the water around it. It would be much easier to neutralize the North Korea threat um, using things like boost-phased interceptors um, and other kinds of advanced technology if we had invest enough money into it, something I continue to push for because the world would be a much better place for us if we still had a challenge with North Korea. They, we still had tens or hundreds of thousands of rockets and artillery aimed at our troops in Seoul and South Korea, but we knew that we could neutralize long-range missiles capable of hitting American soil. Um, that's a very specific challenge that I think we should tackle, tackle immediately. Uh, Gabe Scheinman from the Alexander Hamilton Society, um, also on the board of the Vandenberg Coalition. So thank you for being here tonight. Um, I have a question for you about the defense budget. Uh, Couple years in a row, the Biden administration's uh, budget that they put forth is functionally a real cut, let's say, in what the actual top line number is. Um, it's gotten plussed up once, uh, fairly bipartisanly, actually, and, it, and I think obviously we'll do so again um, shortly. Um, normally, I would say this would be an opportunity for um, conservatives to actually rally to the cause and uh, promote a much, much larger defense budget given the needs that you've outlined here and in your book. Um, and yet, my own views, I don't quite see it coming. I mean, the Heritage Foundation, for example, long stalwart of the right, its own budget blueprint calls for a defense budget of 3% of GDP max, and in the out year is actually down to 2.9, 2.8, and so forth. And so my, my question for you is, especially with the Republican-led House, one is, do you have a number in mind that you think is necessary uh, based on the threat that you laid of what you think the defense budget should be? And, and the corollary to that is, what do you think groups on the outside could do to, to help that or support that along? Thank you. I mean, I think a, a, rough, a rough guide or a rule of thumb would be 3 to 5% annual real growth. Uh, so that's over inflation. So that's a lot of growth right now. And inflation has been taking a big buy down of the department, uh, whether it's you know, troops take home pay or whether it's uh, purchasing power uh, for major weapon systems. Um, three percent is in my three percent of our economy is way too low historically. It's something that uh, it is it entices our adversaries, um, and we need to get get it up substantially. Um, I, I think we'll see again see a substantial increase over the Biden um, budget. It's pretty shocking that after what happened last year uh, in Afghanistan or what's happened in Ukraine that uh, President Biden again submitted such a woefully inadequate budget. You know, Jimmy Carter, um, even Jimmy Carter, and uh, after the uh, terrible year of 1979, submitted a, a defense budget that 
kind of gave Ronald Reagan a, a running start after 1980 with his buildup. Um, so you might say that Jimmy Carter was mugged by reality in 1979. Unfortunately, Joe Biden was mugged by reality uh, in his first year in office, but so far he's refused to press charges and, uh, and arm up uh, our military as he should. Um, I won't, I, I'm not letting a seat, the cat out of the bag here, because I guess the cat was out of the bag and only the strongest I write about this. The reason we were able to secure a relatively good defense authorization bill last year is Senate Democrats had included, um, I think it was $25, million, $25 billion over the Biden budget which alienated a lot of the far left progressives in the House who refused to vote for that. So to pass the annual defense bill, Pelosi had to strip out all of the left wing social engineering provisions um, to get House Republicans to vote for it. Um, I hope that dynamic plays out again over the next uh, month or so. Uh, it'll be very different though in the new Congress. Uh, I know the House majority is not as large as I might have hoped, but it's still a majority. That means they're going to have a majority on the Armed Services Committee on, on defense appropriations as well. So I think you'll be, see uh, more substantial increases in defense spending. And a lot of these things too, I mean, these are th the things that can be spent very rapidly and need to be spent very rapidly. You know, it's, you know, things like the Javelin or advanced high-tech weapon, but you know, it's not a stealth bomber, it's not an aircraft carrier. If you give industry enough certainty um, um, and there's enough buyers, and those buyers are committed, whether our military or our allies' militaries, they can ramp up production, and they need to ramp up production, but again, they need that kind of certainty, both in the, in the funding um, and in the, uh, the fixed purchases. We have time for about two more questions. Yes, right over here. Hi, Senator Christopher Lang, no affiliation. Um, you, there was an earlier question. You should say unemployed intern just here to eat the free food. <laughs> oh, no, private sector. <laughs> um, so uh, there was a question earlier about soft power and then Chinese influence within the United States. Um, with soft power, U.S. aid is, of course, one of our tools around the world for soft power. In light of what China is doing both in the Middle East and especially in the African region, in East Africa especially, with their own aid systems, with infrastructural projects where they're sort of building out their own future reserves as well as building out influence through building tech centers for Kenya, for instance. How should we be thinking about our own tool of soft power in USA differently in light of what they're doing and somewhat of the ineffective nature that it's been for the last several decades in many ways? Well, I don't think that we should look at China and see them as 10 feet tall and invincible and can do no wrong and that we should do what they're doing. I mean, a lot of their Belt and Road projects are faltering, and the idea that they are going to be able to basically foreclose on nation states has turned out not to be exactly what they expected. Um, same thing when it comes to a lot of their industrial planning, especially the kind of uh, more centralized management that Xi has introduced in, in recent years. Um, goes, going back to the point I made about Ukraine, the most important kinds of aid we provide is still military aid, um, and, and it would be foolish, in my opinion, to be counterproductive to cut off our nose to spite our face because we don't like what this or that country is doing if it remains in our security interest to provide that kind of aid and to support them. Um, here I'd cite the example of, of Joe Biden and the Democrats' deeply counterproductive uh, stance towards Saudi Arabia and this uh, kind of short-sighted desire to ostracize or alienate a nation that's been a partner of ours going back 80 years. You know, some Senate Democrats have even said they want to cut off all arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Um, well, Saudi Arabia has certain security concerns from Iran and from Iran's proxies, especially in Yemen. If we were to cut all aid to Saudi Arabia, those security concerns are not going to go away. They're simply going to turn elsewhere to try to satisfy them. And who they're going to turn to is probably China. Um, so the thing that we, again, provide most around the world, especially to our longtime partners uh, and friends, is that kind of security assistance. And we do that, again, I would stress, as I say, and only strong, not because it's in their interest, though it might be, we do it because it's in our interest. It's in our interest, as I write in the book, uh, to have beachheads and lodgements uh, of freedom uh, all around the world. Um, that's why when you look at our bases, you know, they're kind of in the Eurasian littoral. Um, to provide us the kind of footholds that we would need to make sure that no nation or combination of nation can ever use 
the old world uh, and unite its resources and its people and its terrain, all of which is much greater than ours in the new world against us. Um, that's why security aid has always been, in my opinion, our most important kind of aid and remains so. All right, last question. Yes, Georgina. Hi, I'm Senator. Thank you so much for speaking today. Um, I guess my question is on U.S. energy independence. I would argue that U.S. energy independence is a key national security issue. So we're seeing today, it's a boldening rogue regimes and our inability to unleash American energy makes us more vulnerable and we can't help our allies abroad. With the 118th Congress and also the administration, what do you think should be the Republican Party's top priorities with U.S. energy independence? Thanks for the question. It's a, you're exactly right. I mean, I've got a section in my book about this. Um, sometimes you hear politicians, usually Democratic politicians or, or liberal writers, say that energy independence is it, just a slogan or it's just a talking point. You know, we can't achieve it, or you know, we're still dependent, you know, on world markets and so forth. But it's not because think about what its opposite is. Its opposite is energy dependence, and that is a dangerous, even slavish position for any nation to be in, especially a superpower like ours. Again, fortunately, we're blessed with this great land that has so much abundant of resources that we can not just fuel ourselves, but much of the world, certainly many of our partners and allies. Uh, and it's the height of folly that the Democratic Party has undertaken for these last 15 or 20 years to try to suppress fossil fuel production um, in the name of green or clean energy. I mean, look, it's, I mean, Wind and, and solar power are fine in their place, and their place is as a small supplement to reliable, affordable baseload power, which is generated almost entirely in this country by natural gas, coal, and nuclear power. Um, and we're the world's superpower when it comes to fossil fuel production. The world's superpower when it comes to green, so-called green or clean technology is China. So, you know, progressives may march under the banner of climate change, but it looks a lot like China's five-star flag to me because we would be, we are intentionally harming our energy production by trying to wean ourselves off fossil fuels, which will never be possible in our, anyone's lifetime here anyway. Um, and we are intentionally um, supporting the Chinese energy model that they want the rest of the world to follow. They're not following it. I mean, they're building more natural gas storage facilities and refineries and digging more coal mines than you know, the rest of the world combined probably. Um, so we need to use, especially with the majority we have in the House, we need to use the, the power and the leverage we have to try to roll back some of the Biden administration's worst uh, policies towards natural gas, oil, and coal production in America. There's no single thing that they've done to kind of hamstring American energy production. It's kind of a death of a thousand cuts, so there's no single silver bullet. Um, but our objective should be to, uh, to maximize, to the greatest extent possible, fossil fuel production in this country. Um, again, I mean, if, if you care about climate change, and many Americans do, that should also be your goal because uh, American fossil fuel production um, and manufacturing of it, so to speak, is uh, much cleaner than anything else you have all around the world. Much better to have American coal in the markets and other nations' coals. Much better to have our natural gas liquefied set around the world than Russia's natural gas, if you just look at the practices for harnessing those. Again, those needs around the world are never going to change, just whether or not we're going to meet them or someone else, probably not our friend, is going to meet them. Um, and for that matter, I mean, the ability to, to change and adapt and innovate uh, to counteract the effects of potential climate change are all driven by fossil fuels. Um, I mean, if you look at living standards uh, over human history. They're basically the same for all of human history until about 250 years ago. Our founders lived the same way that Jesus' disciples did, especially if you were uh, just a commoner, um, you know, in Jesus' time versus our founding. And it was only with, you know, the man's ability to, you know, turn coal into power with turbines and 100 years later oil and gas and another 100 years later nuclear power that you see living standards going like this over time. The same thing will continue, even if you care very much about the effects of climate change. The way to mitigate them is continued economic growth, prosperity, and innovation that, again, is literally powered by American fossil fuels and nuclear power. Well, with that, Senator, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for, for our audience for coming. Um, 
Just as a reminder, um, Only the Strong did just come out this month, so if you have not purchased a copy, please do so. I'll do my arbitrary plug for the book, and also an arbitrary plug for the Vandenberg Coalition's um, Future of Conservative Foreign Policy series, which we will be continuing next year with additional conversations with governors, senators, and congressmen um, to speak about their foreign policy vision for the future. So thank you very much, Senator, for joining us. Thank you all.